uh, on a bright Monday morning, hot Monday morning rather. And uh, I have planned my talk for, for about an hour or so. And I had a, a you know a quick chat with Dr. Srabjot uh, before the workshop and sort of understood what is expected of this. The, so the flow is going to be like this. Um, uh, we are going to start off with some basics, basically uh, explain what is happening in the AI world today. Uh, what are the areas of practical applications where AI is spreading really, really fast? Uh, I mean, we all know that uh, AI, machine learning, deep learning was confined to a large extent to, uh, to you know, research and academia until about, let's say, seven to eight years ago. But that's, that's changing really, really fast today. So I'll try to, uh, to table uh, the areas, the applications where uh, it is being adopted uh, in, a, in, a, in a wider fashion today. That's how we are going to start the talk. And then very quickly, we will, we will launch into the AI computing ecosystem. And the AI computing ecosystem, uh, as many of you know, uh, is, is, is evolving at a very, very fast pace over the past few years. Once again, four to five years. So the last couple of years have been incredible in terms of the development that, have, that has been happening. So we are going to learn what are the new things that have been happening in the AI computing world in the recent times. And uh, uh, I would say 80% of my talk would be concentrated on the software ecosystem that is building up for AI. And then of course, we'll uh, wind up with a, a little introduction on the hardware side also, the GPU side as well. Uh, what are the latest, latest developments on the GPU side? So that's the plan for, for uh, the next, uh, maybe an hour or so. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, please note down your questions. I, I guess the questions should be asked at the end of the session. Um, and yeah, I think that's better because it's, it's, it's a large audience. Maybe we will reserve some time for the Q&A at the end of the session. And uh, please note down your questions and shoot any questions you have and I'll be happy to answer them. With that, um, let's quickly jump into the, uh, into the session today. So the expanding universe of scientific computing is, is really, really exciting today. And I would say that we are all fortunate to, to actually witness a big change that is happening in the area of scientific computing. I mean, not very often, it's not a you know, regular evolution that is happening. This is more like a revolution, so far as scientific computing is concerned. And um, one important thing is the, the uh, areas of AI and HPC. HPC, as we know, high performance computing um, has been there for like uh, several decades now. But the, the area of HPC and AI are converging together. And I would call out that uh, uh, there are six major pillars that define some scientific computing today. The first one obviously is data analytics. Once again, it has been there for long, long very long. It is not nothing new, uh, but, but it has undergone a big sea change in the way it has been working for several decades now. And then comes the simulation. We are going to talk a little about it uh, um, later. And of course, visualization. Uh, visualization could be for creating uh, your three-dimensional design or for visualizing your results, um, bringing out dashboards, bringing out uh, things that you're able to visually monitor and understand better rather than looking at uh, uh, complicated data. So visualization is a broad area. And visualization also has made tremendous strides over the past few years. Last but not the least, we know AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, it is becoming a very, very strong contributor to the area of scientific computing. And of course, the advent of cloud um, is, is accelerating the process. And last but not the least, it's streaming, particularly the advancements in 5G. Uh, I mean, mark my words, 5G is going to change the way our lives are working now in in, 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 in manner that you will not even be able to imagine. You and I will not even be able to imagine um, as of today. 5G is going to change a lot of things, a lot of things. And all these three, all these six pillars work in tandem together. Uh, and this, the definition of scientific computing, the universe of scientific computing is expanding. And one very important pillar, which is, I would say, a more recent development, if not from the theoretical point of view, but more from an application point of view, practical application point of view, is obviously AI. And the reason for, for, for this expansion is, is, as we all know, once again, the availability of data. 
data is 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 available in plenty there is no right english word to 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 you know sort of explain how big how massive this explosion of data uh, is happening we all know that i guess but this also brings uh, uh, the problem of how do i manage data so much data is available data is is being spewed by by um, sensors the, uh, the internet of things i mean anything and everything is getting uh, fitted with sensors today uh, as i always say uh, in a in a lighter way from milking cows to to the to the rockets that fly in the sky everything is emitting um, data sensor data how do i make sense of that to 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 the enormous amount of data that comes out of social media and there are so many other such examples as you know how do i make sense of that data and a lot of work is happening towards that once you have a large amount of data how do you organize the data how do you prep the data how do you visualize the data and derive some actionable intelligence from the data that is what is is the big focus today so far as the area of scientific computing is concerned and as i mentioned hpc and ai are converging to solve some very very grand problems huge problems which 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 were unsolvable until uh, until uh, very recent past um things like uh, uh, you know drug discovery um nuclear uh, fusion uh, um climate and weather modeling uh, etc etc which have been uh, traditional hpc is now moving a lot towards ai so if you could imagine uh, hpc and ai as two circles that are overlapping with one another the 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 sector which overlaps is growing bigger and bigger and the circles are and the and the center points of the circle are moving uh, towards one another that is a very very important development because it, there will be a very very thin line of demarcation between traditional hpc and ai uh, in the near future and so hence what we call as intelligent hpc is is getting uh, driven right so there is uh, an intertwining of of the traditional hpc techniques from uh, ai say for example if you need to i mean i'll just ex- try to ex- uh, explain that with the help of one example which is very relevant in today's world drug discovery so in drug discovery you had to do your uh, using hyperfast computing techniques you need to uh, do your modeling of of your uh, proteins of your um drugs etc and then predict how it is going to happen and traditional hpc techniques were always used for doing that for doing the simulations but now with the help of ai with the help of machine learning techniques you will be able to predict instead of actually modeling and, and analyzing the behavior you will be able to predict how a protein is going to react to your drug right so and hence uh you 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 can change your iterations accordingly you can change your iterations much faster and so what a, a drug discovery life cycle which typically takes about 10 more than 10 years 10 to 15 years using traditional hpc techniques can come down to few years just by using the predictive modeling techniques employed in ai machine learning and deep learning so that is one very very typical textbook classic example of where hpc and ai or 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 uh, combining together so once again this is the the scientific computing workflow it all starts with data huge amounts of data a lot of data needs to be churned out and then you simulate and you do very modeling techniques multiple modeling techniques deep learning machine learning um, etc advanced data analytics which we all group under the category of ai and then you visualize that the results and this is where um, nvidia plays a huge role gpus play a huge role and and uh, it, it is not an exaggeration if i make a statement that uh, the in many of the the the, uh, the the technological advancements that are happening in the area of ai machine learning are centered around uh, uh, around the gpu computing technology today uh, i am not telling this just because i am an nvidian uh, of course i am a proud nvidian but uh, even if i put that uh, that that fact aside for a minute it's a scientific truth it's a technological truth that gpus are the center point of several of the key advancements that are happening in the area of ai machine learning and deep learning today now why does gpu play a big role um, i mean it, it it is very simple uh, the, the big difference between a cpu and a gpu is a cpu is typically architected to be a serial computing engine and a gpu is architected to be a parallel computing engine nothing wrong in the architecture of the cpu i mean even today a large uh, portion of the 
of the of the problems that we solve fall under the category of serial computing only where the the, the if you break down the the problem into smaller problems each of those problems are or 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 solved one after the other but then there are there is another set of problems which 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 cannot be solved that way it's going to take um, like months to solve such problems if you if you solve it serially one after the other if the sub components are solved serially one after the other and that is where the concept of parallel computing kicks in wherein you take a large problem a very large problem and break down the large problem into a very large number of small threads i repeat you you break down the large problem into large number of small threads tiny threads and each of these threads are run in parallel so instead of solving the sub components serially one after the other you solve them in parallel and that parallelism what we achieve is massive it is not the parallelism that you see uh, pictorially depicted in the in the, the slide that you are seeing it is massive parallelism and uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, of of software that goes into it obviously the hardware has to support it which the gpus do because the gpus are are architected to be parallel computing engine there are like thousands of cores that are built into your gpu as as compared to tens of cores that go into your cpu but then if the the hardware is, is a very important component but i would say even more important and even more contributing factor to this parallelization which i explained now the concept of parallelization that i explained now is the software that goes into it and i'm going to delve a lot into the software component in the subsequent 30 minutes or so with that introduction let let's quickly uh, uh, you know discuss what are the areas where deep learning um, ai in particular machine learning of course and more focus on deep learning which i would say is is a subset of machine learning that's how i would define deep learning deep learning is a technique to do to do machine learning um where it is being used today uh one one word of caution here uh, i'll be using the terms ml and dl uh, many times during the talk so um ml is traditional machine learning that's what i mean and deep learning is deep learning as we know uh but but practically we know that deep learning is a subset of machine learning so it actually is wrong to say difference between machine learning and deep learning because deep learning is part of machine learning but for practical uh you know discussions uh, you can assume that when i say ml machine learning i mean the traditional techniques and deep learning is deep learning right so if you if you ask me where is deep learning used today a safe answer is it is used used everywhere and i'm not exaggerating from internet and cloud to the uh, to the recommendation engines to to when you go to a website and try to buy something what gets served to you as a recommendation by the website um, customer behavior analytics language processing language translation medicine and biology big strides are happening i'm going to talk a little bit deeper into this in the in the next few minutes or so media and entertainment um once again a traditional visualization and um, so far as rendering is concerned a more or like a high performance computing technique is used has started using a lot of ai and deep learning in particular uh, particularly making the good use of the nlp and the and the speech techniques that are available uh, today and security and defense surveillance uh, Uh, safe cities smart cities retail analytics etc uh, last but not the least autonomous machines so autonomous machines once again is an umbrella term it does not restrict itself to self driving cars which is a which is obviously a big big uh, contributor to the term autonomous machines but then it goes much beyond that right and we are going to talk a little bit about it let me start off with real time streaming streaming video analytics see today uh, every city is fitted with thousands of cameras tens of thousands of cameras and they they capture live videos and these videos live videos are streamed in real time now the biggest challenge is how do i make sense of so many live video streams and 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 predict an event to happen and hence do the right thing maybe prevent it or or do the right thing whatever is need to be done here we are not talking about when i say intelligent video analytics i am not talking about doing a post mortem where an incident has happened and we do go and try and analyze what, why that happened that's not what i'm talking about how do i use real time streaming video uh, videos to do an analysis and predict an event and do the right things to stop the event or avert the uh, uh, unwanted uh, event etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's used in multiple places access control managing operations parking management traffic engineering huge strides are happening in the areas of safe, safe cities and smart cities once again as i mentioned thanks to the tens of thousands of cameras that uh, that monitor every city today 
uh, retail analytics, a huge area that is coming up in a, in a really, really big way. And you will see a big spurt in the demand of retail analytics in the days to come. Optical inspection of, of manufacturing lines, smart factories, uh, logistics, content filtering, etc. So these are all places where video analytics is, 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 is kicking in in a, in a big way. And of course, the talking specifically about the smart cities and the safe cities, um, you know, mm, uh, vague, I mean, here we are talking not only about, uh, uh, you know, detection of things, we are also talking about classification and tracking. And uh, of course, there are a lot of concerns on the privacy aspects and all. I'm not going to go into that. that that's not the, um, the, including the scope of this talk. But then uh, very, very common tasks which are taken for granted today are possible only because of the recent advancements in deep learning and AI computing. Things like, you know, uh, tracking vehicles, tracking people, face, face recognition, um, scene parsing, et cetera, et cetera. All these things are making big strides today. Then comes the IoT. I would say this is uh, also seeing a big, big upsurge today. Um, I'll just take one example, a very commonly used one and a very, very relevant one to, to drive home the point here. What we call as digital twins. Um, digital twins, once again, uh, is applied in many, many industries today. But it all started off, I would say, with the, air, uh, the aerospace industry, wherein, you know, the yeah, uh, let's say that there is a there is a, the, this is a particular engine model which is used in, in, in a particular aircraft, and let's call that model as uh, model X Y Z. And model X Y Z has got let us say uh, one thousand um, one thousand of them are flying in the sky. One thousand specimens of model uh, model X Y Z are flying in the sky, and let's assume that the serial numbers are one to one thousand. That's the serial number you identify that. So digital twin is 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 is, is a technique where all these 1,000 individual engines of the same model are fitted with sensors, multiple sensors, temperature sensor, pressure sensor, altitude sensors, many, many sensors that, that determine the, the, uh, the, the, the behavior of an, or other that predict the behavior of an, that understand the behavior of, the, of an engine and hence send a lot of signals to the ground station. Now, using the, the, the digital twin, each of these 1,000 engines will have its own digital mockup in the, in the data center and hence, the behavior of every engine, every individual engine is assimilated in the data center. Hence, instead of doing a predictive maintenance of that particular model called XYZ, which, which is how it used to happen. If it is model XYZ, you need to maintain it once in three months, once in six months. No, that is not what we're talking about here. Here, um, I'm sorry, instead of doing a preventive maintenance, I, I misspelled it. Instead of say, doing a preventive maintenance, which is a periodic maintenance, here what you're doing is a predictive maintenance. It belongs to the same model XYZ, but then serial number one has a different uh, flying characteristics than the, 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 the serial number uh, 15 because of an attitude difference or temperature difference or whatever, the environmental conditions, etc. So serial number one needs maintenance uh, based on the digital analysis of the digital twin data. One needs maintenance once in three months, whereas 15 needs maintenance only once in six months. This is saving billions of dollars for the, for the aerospace industry. Uh, whatever I'm talking here is not a futuristic. If this is happening today, as we speak, this is employed worldwide by the big, big, uh, uh, you know, aircraft engine manuf turbine manufacturers uh, like you know, you know who. So this, this is a big thing that is happening today, and there is a lot of work happening in this area. And it is not restricted only to aircraft engines. Things like power plant engineering, um, railway lines, uh, uh, process planning. Uh, smart factories, everything where, you know, um, sensors skew a lot of data that is using these techniques to do uh, a lot of, lot of uh, things which are predictive in nature and just not periodic in, in, in nature. And, and it, the, the list expands to, to agriculture, to manufacturing, process plants, railway lines, as we talked about. And uh, many of these names, I, I think most of these names are familiar to you. Companies like GE, Mitsubishi, NVIDIA, JD.com. These are all big companies, big names. And they are all using the industrial AI applications in a big way. And this is one more area that is being, that is coming up, coming up and is expected to have a big growth in the days to come. On a related note, robotics, that's also boosting every industry. Now there are two different types of robots. First is obviously the programmable robot, which does specific things. For example, on a on a on a 
manufacturing line picking up a, a nut, picking up a bolt, putting it in the right direction, uh, and uh, uh, tightening the faster, etc. So these are all these have been automated for very long. Robots can robo arms can do that, and that's a programmable do- robot. That's not what we are talking about here. Here we are talking about intelligent robots which understand the environment, which understand what is needed of them uh, for when when let's say the assembly line changes, when the when the when the the process changes when the when the component that gets manufactured or assembled changes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just like how a human operator can understand the the environment, understand what is expected of him or her, and and modify his techniques, his tools accordingly. If we can talk about a robotic and automation process, where the robo also becomes intelligent to some extent. Obviously, it's it can never become as intelligent as a human being. I mean, thank God, I, I don't want it to become as intelligent as a human being. I, I always want human beings to be superior to machines. But but can they adapt to changing conditions? That is what is the modern robotics that we are talking about. And huge strides are happening in that area as well. Another very interesting thing is conversational AI. So conversational AI is, is, uh, is, is such an uh, interesting, but very, very important subject also today because of the practicality of its application in multiple areas. I'm going to talk about it later when I'm talking about the software ecosystem. But then now let me just um, quickly pass pass that and and we'll go deeper into conversation AI, the recent developments in a little while from now. But healthcare, robotics, finance, retail, you name it. I mean, transportation, everywhere conversational AI is making big strides today. Now, when I say conversational AI, only one point I would like to make here is that conversational AI is contextualized human-like conversation. That is what is conversational AI. If I'm just going to ask a machine, hey, what is the weather outside? The weather outside is like 32 degrees Celsius. Will it rain tomorrow? No, it's not. It's not it is not predicted that it will rain tomorrow. What is the best route to the airport? And so Google does a search and gives you that. No, that is not his conversational AI. Conversational AI is not simple Q and A happening between a machine and a man. Uh, Conversational AI is when it is very contextualized. It is very human-like. And a lot of syntax and semantics of of human language and linguistics goes into that. That is what is conversational AI. And we are going to talk a little about it um, more in the later slides. Now, and then comes... The exciting area of medical research, we mentioned about it uh, briefly in the beginning, uh, you know, mm, cancer reduction and uh, uh, drug discovery, uh, mutations, uh, studying mutations, molecular activity, uh, studying molecular activity, uh, and predicting, very importantly, predicting them, all these are, are happening with the help of uh, AI. The last area of application with this, uh, I think I'll be move, quickly move into the software ecosystem, but then the last area of application, I would say, the, the epitome of, of, of deep learning, the, I would say the biggest achievement of deep learning is automotive, right? Uh, not in terms of practical applications because there are more life-saving techniques like uh, medical research and all which are using AI, but in terms of, uh, of the complexity that is involved, in my personal view, this is the epitome or the biggest achievement of deep learning. Because, hey, when you drive a car, and when you go from point A to point B, your brain does so many things that are extraordinarily complicated, which we don't realize. We just drive and we don't realize all the, the great things that our brain does. I mean, simple things like fusion of senses, like your eyes pick up um, signals, your ears pick up signals. If there is a smoke, your, your nose picks up signals. Uh, the haptic feedback comes to your, to your, to your palms and your, your, your foot. So fusing all these senses and taking it to the brain and the brain making instantaneous decisions uh, in microseconds and then passing it back onto your feet and your, and your, and your hands and, 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 and ordering them to, 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 to respond. And, 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 and very importantly, you respond and more importantly, your response is conveyed to the mechanical parts of the, of the car uh, with the minimum time lag and, and the right action is taken, which could be stopping the car or steering the the direction, et cetera, et cetera. This is a very, very complicated process that your, our brain does. And imagine automating them. Imagine teaching a machine to do that. Sense of fusion, understanding the, uh, the environment, localization, um, uh, uh, taking instant decisions inside the car. There is no chance for you to send the signal back to the data center, take a decision there and bring back the, 
decision to the car and implement it is it's not possible decisions have to be taken inside the car and implementing it that is a very very complex thing today and that is what is happening there and this is going to transform the way automotive this is i would say this is the biggest opportunity that that lies ahead of ai deep learning in particular in the days to come and you will see huge amounts of of um, you know uh, revenues getting generated out of the automotive world through these techniques right then autonomous vehicles mobility as a service uh, and connected vehicles very important last mile logistics how do i connect up the last mile uh, connectivity connect factories and robotics we talked about it earlier. this is going this is evolving into multiple billion dollars industry right thanks to the recent few developments unfortunate developments uh, it has taken a little slow it has slowed down a little bit but mark my words this is going to be a big boom um in the next few years the automotive industry all right and uh, it involves a lot of steps collecting data training models simulating the desire, the, the the behavior uh, and of course in car uh, intelligence uh, etc etc and testing there are huge areas which are happening here uh, in this area and this itself is an end to end a whole complete ecosystem the autonomous ecosystem that is bring, that is coming up in a big way which many people practically don't realize i mean people who are working in this field either in the automotive industry or in 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 a in a uh, in a ai industry like what i belong to we understand how big this is going to be but generally people who are working on the application side of it uh, students etc they don't really understand how big the boom is going to be so far as automotive is is, is concerned right from data ingestion to curation of data to labeling to training and replay and simulation simulation itself is a is a huge area and uh, it's very interesting actually say for example um, i mean if obviously i want to collect data of of bangalore roads so that i can simulate it uh, i mean i run the car when it is bright and sunny outside but how do i behave how do i know how the the, the environment the, 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 how do i uh, i i know make the um, how do, how do i train the model to to behave when it is let us say uh, snowing in bangalore when there is mist in bangalore or when there is rain in bangalore i cannot wait for snow in bangalore to happen and then drive my car exactly when there it is snowing and and capture the data right i cannot wait for rains to happen at least rains maybe i can wait but snow i'm i'm not going to wait I, i cannot wait but that's a that's a need i mean i need to train my 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 model for every every possible scenario so that is where simulation comes into play where you simulate the environment you simulate road conditions how do i simulate a bump how do i simulate a road deviation you cannot wait for that to practically happen or you can, you cannot construct uh, you know deviations and bumps and things on the road and train the car on that right so using some basic data are you able to simulate environment are you able to simulate weather are you able to simulate the the driving conditions only if you are able to do that you can train the car on billions and billions of miles of data and hence make it a self sufficient model and so simulation is is by itself is a huge area beyond one 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 can no um, one can think about right so uh, talking about the factories of the future visual inspection connected factories autonomous robots i think we talked about it these are all the areas in which um, which are all coming up in a big way that sort of uh, concludes my 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 application area and we'll quickly jump into the uh, into the computing area a computing area um so as a quick recap what we did is we discussed uh, how ai is evolving in the recent past how the 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 the, the areas of uh, scientific computing uh, is changing in a big way and how ai and hpc traditional high, high performance computing are converging towards one another and then we we touched upon the practical applications of deep learning like recommender systems like uh, video surveillance uh, conversational ai medical research autonomous machines robotics uh, ai of the uh, the uh, ai for the factory uh, which is uh, smart factories etc uh, etc et we discussed about the practical applications where uh, ai and deep learning are coming up in a in a big way mm, now let's quickly move on to the next chapter of my talk um and uh, before i get started there i would like just one confirmation from someone that i am uh, 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 you are able to hear hear me well um yes we are so excellent no problem thank thank you thank you um yeah let's let's now move on to the next 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 chapter of my talk 
which is the a computing side now all this is good they are sound very very nice and rosy when we, when we talk about it but what happens in the background how does the computation happen i mean by now i'm sure all of you have realized that it's a very complicated computation that we are talking about there are two complexities here number one huge data enormous amounts of data huge huge data needs to be churned and i mean the moment i see data you all know that i mean it's i mean it's just not you know um, computing the data it also is getting the data uh, prepping the data annotating the data um, making the data look like the way i want it which is defining data frames and then uh, you know cleaning the data and then running it through a simulation and then last but not the least visualizing the results so that first complexity is managing data the second complexity is the the models that are becoming very complex and very deep today as we know uh, the big difference between machine learning and deep learning uh, once again quick reminder deep learning is part of machine learning the subset of machine learning when i say machine learning i mean traditional machine learning and deep learning is deeper the big difference between machine learning and deep learning is machine learning was confined to to uh, you know um, uh, structured data uh, only and hence uh your uh, uh, your the scope of data that can be analyzed using traditional machine learning techniques uh, was uh, was restricted to let's say hundreds of variables that are available for for one particular domain but deep learning expanded the scope of machine learning and you are able to to do uh, to to analyze unstructured data also in addition to structured data unstructured data like the speech that i'm giving today a video or 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 the content that is hidden inside a instead a book things like this unstructured data can also be understood thanks to deep learning and hence instead of using thousands of variables to make your i mean i mean hundreds of variables to make a decision you you can end up making thousands of variables or sometimes even tens of thousands of variables uh, uh, pertaining to your domain and and hence make more accurate decisions uh, using deep learning techniques now there are two work streams as we know the first work stream is the is the training part of it and uh, uh training involves a lot of data and a lot of very complex models i mean the example that you are seeing on the first box is 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 an is a typical example of a, of how nlp is happening in the recent past and i'm sure many of you who are working in the nlp area will 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 recognize all these jargon so uh, which basically things like bert which is a transformer based uh, modeling technique to gpt2 bagatron bert etc etc uh these are all very complex models but these are all not luxury they are more of a necessities and the conversational ai the big 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 uh, developments in the area of conversational ai is possible only because of of advancements in bert gpt2 etc so the training involves handling very large data and very complex models and your models are getting born every day gone are the days when people are happy with uh, cnns and rnns uh, and lstms i mean they are not going to serve the purpose anymore here we are talking about advanced modeling techniques advanced new techniques new techniques like i mean they are not really new i would say in the real sense of the word but gans uh, generative adversarial networks they 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 help a lot in the advancement of the techniques um reinforcement learning once again um, helps quite a bit and newer and newer methodologies are being born and and today people cannot obtain their intended results just by working on one or two models not one or two cnns today we are talking about ensemble of models multi variant models where you have many models many model each of them are very deep model but each of these models are are assembled together and um, they work in unison and the end product at the end result is what can 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 give you the desired effect so we are talking about ensemble of models so at one one side the training needs lot of a computing right complex models and big data on the right side what you see is the inferencing part of the deployment part where okay you have trained beautiful model let's say face recognition you have created a beautiful model in the near data center which can recognize faces like with huge levels of accuracy maybe mid, mid 90s or levels of accuracy fantastic but it's need it needs to be deployed it need i mean it's not it's not going to serve any purpose by visiting the data center where should it be deployed it should be deployed on a railway platforms on the dusty streets of bangalore or or on or, or on the entrance of an airport etc etc that is where the face recognition needs to be deployed and that's a totally different ball game and the ai computing needs there are very very different from the training needs 
because that's where the, the exciting area of edge computing or edge AI as it is commonly referred to kicks in. And here, if, how the basic fundamental difference between the first, the first box and the second box is first box deals with large data, large models. Second box deals with instantaneous data, almost real time data and very small models because it, it achieves a specific tasks, right? And that is where edge AI comes into play. And we're going to, uh, to discuss how the computing needs are different for both training and inferencing. Now, um, uh, so NVIDIA provides the, the platform on which um, training happens and on which deployment happens or inferencing happens. And so how does the platform look like? Okay, I'm going to start from the bottom of the stack. At the bottom most is the hardware, um, which is GPUs, which is a parallel computing engine. They have thousands of cores that constitute a GPU and uh, up to eight GPUs can be, uh, can be put in one machine, which means um, um, tens of thousands of cores work in one machine. And any number of such machines can be clustered together to, 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 to solve a problem, which means hundreds of thousands of cores contained in multiple systems, each of these systems supporting up to eight GPUs. Uh, each GPU can have thousands of cores. So we, are keep, we keep on building the, 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 the number of cores that work in unison to, to, to solve problems. That is the bottom most stack. On top of that lies uh, the parallel computing um, software framework, which is called as CUDA. Many of you might have heard about it. CUDA is our parallel computing software favor, compute unified device architecture, compute unified device architecture, on which all the, all the parallel computing uh, frameworks are written. That's the backbone of, of whatever we do in NVIDIA, so far as the software is concerned. And on top of that lies multiple buckets, which we, which we call as CUDA X. X could be machine learning, uh, uh, multiple SDKs and libraries for machine learning, could be for deep learning, could be for high performance computing, virtualization, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Simulation, visualization, many many areas in which uh, CUDA X comes into play. On top of that lies the application and the frameworks, the blue layer, which is industry standard, right? Uh, these terms are very common today: Python, PyTorch, and TensorFlow, and MXNet, and uh, and, um, uh, and Rapid, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. These are all uh, frameworks that are very commonly used today, and enormous works goes into this this framework. And um, the big companies like Google, Facebook, et cetera, uh, work very closely with NVIDIA. We work very closely with them. And we ensure that these frameworks are fully optimized to run on GPUs in the most, in the most optimal way. And on top of that lies the customer use cases, right? And this is where the majority of the work happens so far as end user application is concerned. And as deep learning, uh, uh, as data scientists, as deep learning developers, machine learning developers, most of the times you will be working on the top layer only. But I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling that nobody works on the bottom three layers. That's not what I'm telling. But then the percentage of people who work on the top layer is significantly higher than the ones who work uh, on the layers below that. So that is how the, 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 uh, the software stack uh, looks like. Um, so far, a big focus, as you'd have realized, has been on the deep learning part of it. But that is not the end of it all. Data sciences keeps evolving and traditional machine learning is also very important. And whatever you're seeing on the screen is a typical way in which data, data flow happens. I mean, we need to wrangle data, uh, which comes from multiple sources. Uh, uh, if I take the healthcare industry, it could be medical devices, like a, let's say an ECG machine or a, or a, or a medical apparatus, or, uh, or, and, and then prescriptions, medical records, claims, uh, insurance claims, variables, et cetera, et cetera. All these, excuse me, excuse me. All these provide a lot of data that goes to the data lake and then you prep the data, uh, define data frames and then you train the data and deploy it. Now the good thing is, thanks to all the developments that have been happening over the past several years, all these, these uh, almost all these steps are now getting accelerated by GPUs. So the, 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 the message here is that the GPU based acceleration is not restricted only to deep learning, but the entire data sciences pipeline is getting accelerated through GPUs. 
and whatever you are seeing on the left side the blue colored ones are very popular uh, uh, you know uh, applications and frameworks like pandas for for uh, you know defining data frames scikit learn for your machine learning etc etc uh, i'm sure you are familiar with with many of these these uh, uh, these tools the good thing now is these are all moving to being gpu accelerated say for example if you have been using pandas for defining your data frames it is re getting replaced today but it can be replaced today by uh, a framework which is called as kudias kuda based data frames and the best part of the story is that your existing pandas code can be used as it is with with very very minor modifications needed instead of calling in the pandas library you just have to edit the top two lines and and import the kuda li kudf library instead of pandas library instead of importing the scikit learn library you you edit the top two lines and instead of getting the scikit learn calling for the scikit learn library you call qml library so on and so forth and and these are gpu accelerate now it is just not the uh, uh the the data prep part of it uh, classical ml algorithms like the ones which are very commonly used for classification regression inferencing clustering etc they are all getting gpu accelerated today um there are some which 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 give tremendous results and some which are giving relatively um, lesser results but then it is safe to say that many of the commonly used machine learning traditional machine learning algorithms are gpu accelerated today right for example xgboost which is a very commonly used uh, technique xgboost gives enormous results tremendous results uh, when you run it through gpus the acceleration is huge right so i've been using the term it gets accelerated many times right so so what is acceleration let's try to quantify it let's try to make it a bit more tangible than just saying accelerated right when i say accelerated what i mean is this i am not talking about let's say let's say uh, doing a particular data pre preparation task takes let us say 7 days which is not uncommon right which it takes 7 days can i bring it down to few hours can i do it in 6 hours that is what i mean by acceleration i am not talking about bring down 7 days to to 5 days or 7 days to 3 days or 7 days to 1 day that is not what i mean by acceleration can i do a task which has been running for 7 days can i do it in 5 hours in 6 hours what runs for 5 to 6 hours typically can i do it in a few minutes that is what i mean by gpu based acceleration now what is the joy in doing it what is the fun in doing it i mean maybe i can wait for 5 hours i can just fire the solution go home and come back the next day morning and the solution would have would have completed what is the fun in bring down 5 days to to let's say a few minutes do i really need it the answer is the the time to compute 5 hours to 3 minutes or 5 hours to 6 minutes is just a metric of the computing system for you to understand the power of the computing system that is not the end objectives the end objective is just not bring down 5 5 5 hours to 4 4 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever the end objective is how do i make by having the right computing system how do i make sense of more data like exabytes of data will i be able to process enormous amounts of data will i be able to work on high fidelity data can i look at 4k video streaming data can i look at high fidelity data can i increase my batch sizes can i increase my number of e epochs can i run more iterations can i fine tune more hyperparameters can i fine tune thousands of tens of thousands of hyperparameters can i do an ensemble of models can i play around with with more uh, uh, with with newer techniques like you know gans and reinforcement learning and uh, and what not um can i do all these things together and hence get better accuracy out of my models and hence make the model practically deployable that's the underlying thing it is just not going to reside in the data center it's not going to just go into your phd thesis can it practically be deployed if it needs to be practically deployed you need to do all these things increase batch sizes tune tune more number of hyperparameters you use higher fidelity data use more amount of data use very deep models use ensemble of models use newer model modeling techniques play around with models play around with hyperparameters all these things are possible only with the with the right computing uh, power and uh, and uh, 
that is possible uh, uh, with with the right computation power and that is what i am trying to explain with the with the help of a metric which is a, a understandable metric which is computational uh, speed the speed is not the end objective the end objective is getting better better uh, uh, accuracies uh, um, which are equal to or sometimes even better than human levels of accuracy that is what we are talking about here an apache spark uh, spark which is a uh, which is a very very popular framework spark 3.0 is now gpu accelerated right so a single pipeline from ingestion to model preparation to training it runs through spark 3.0 and it is gpu accelerated right that's on the the training part of it now let's move on to the deployment side okay that's where the ha applications come into play right uh, as i mentioned earlier the advent of 5g is going to change a lot of things right so uh, the uh, the uh, 5g plus cloud plus ai plus iot 5g cloud ai iot this is a deadly combination and this is going to change uh, huge things in the in the area of ai and several industries like you know retail smart cities financial services manufacturing auto every industry is going to have an impact because of this right and uh, surveillance and safety and cities and retail and industrial i think we talked about all these things video analytics i think we talked it's sort of repetition sorry about it bear with me for that mm. and uh, once again going back to the uh, you know the 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 scientific computing part of it the nvidia sdks there are several uh, you know mm, Uh, very specialized uh, SDKs and libraries that are available, meant for 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 this uh, for for doing uh, these particular uh, tasks. Example, um, GeForce Now, which is used for cloud gaming, Omniverse uh, for uh, for uh, advanced uh, um, visualization, uh, high performance computing, uh, NVIDIA AI, typically the 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 deep neural networks are accelerated through this, and then Rapids, which is our uh end to end data sciences acceleration platform clara for healthcare uh, nvidia drive for for autonomous machines nvidia isac for robotics and automation merlin nvidia merlin for recommendation engines nvidia jarvis for conversational ai nvidia metropolis for for intelligent video analytics so there are like a, um very specialized tools and techniques uh sdks and libraries that are specifically tailor made custom made for for addressing specific verticals right and each of these topics is is like a two hours talk by itself obviously we are not going to go too deep into it and that is why the nvidia edge computing platform comes into play which is basically a stack of uh, software uh, once again starting from the bottom of the stack you have the hardware on top of it you have cuda x and on top of it the egx stack which is a software stack specific for Uh, 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 for creating application frameworks for for smart cities or robotics or healthcare or or telco and on top of that lies the that third party isv applications and talking specifically about the hardware there are two different types of hardware here the one which goes to the data center uh, uh, which is the uh, the pc express gpus and then the the jetson lineup of gpus which are our embedded systems now the devices are are becoming intelligent today and uh, in many places you cannot have the luxury of sending the signal back to the data center getting inferred at the data center and get the signal back for taking a decision now or rather implementing the decision uh, now that is where intelligent devices come kick in and jetson is our embedded computing platform uh, where the size of the thumbnail a gpu chip with the size of a thumbnail or or even smaller than that can can get embedded in a device like a smart camera or a drone or a surveillance equipment and 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 make that that particular equipment that particular device intelligent and instantaneousations can be taken uh, there right then comes a very important uh, uh, software which is called as tensor and toolkit now you will realize that in the next 5 to 10 minutes time i'm going to talk about a lot of software okay a lot of sdks libraries and the idea for me is that so that you understand the various tools and techniques from a software perspective that are available and i assume that a majority of you would be practicing machine learning um data scientists and please do make use of all these techniques tools and techniques if you are on gpu based computing right so transfer learning toolkit is a very interesting one uh, which basically helps you to make use of industry standard uh, pre trained models and uh, public data but then use 
trans learning techniques to convert that model to suit your needs to get retrained on your data for your practical applications right and uh, there are uh, and uh, that is what trans learning toolkit gives you as as a toolkit there are purpose built pre trained models and then quantization of our, of our training techniques are there and then there are specific techniques like automated mixed precision which basically mixes the precision of let's say fp32 and fp16 um full precision and half precision and hence give you the most optimized um, training results and then of course visualization right and trans learning toolkit is a very powerful tool it is part of the uh, of the nvidia computing platform and uh, anybody who is i'm sure most of you are using pre trained models please do explore this this you will be really surprised at how powerful this is the trans learning toolkit is and it's going to help bring down your your effort uh, drastically another important software which i'd like to introduce is deepstream once again deepstream is an sdk for streaming video analytics if you are employing dl techniques on streaming videos then deepstream is a, is a fantastic tool for you to start use thank you for that and it supports state of the order or neural network architectures that are available today the ones that are on the screen are very um, popular and uh, i'm sure many of you are working on all all these things so a combination of deepstream and trans learning toolkit will help you to achieve very high accuracy levels when you are utilizing the power of these stats these standard pre trained neural networks that are available out there in the industry right okay right um yeah once again pur purpose built pre trained models when it, when it is made to run through these pipelines you will see the levels of accuracy that you are able to uh, to get right now let's quickly move our um, talk to conversational ai okay see i don't have time to cover every uh, sdk and library that is available in with nvidia it's it's a huge ocean and but i'm going to touch upon just uh, uh, maybe three or four more uh, which i think are practically more uh, uh, widely used than the rest uh, and one very important thing is the conversational ai and uh, nvidia jarvis is a conversational ai uh, sdk Uh, library is a set of libraries and sdks right so what does jarvis do jarvis is a multi modal conversational ai service right what do i mean by multi modal like if i go to a a retail store and i point my finger at at one particular object and then say i say hey what is the price of that object the, what is the price of that here all the three uh, um subsets of deep learning come into play uh vision computer vision because the camera has to understand which object my finger is pointing towards uh, nlp and speech because somebody has to a machine has to understand the, the what are, what is that i'm questioning um, what is the price of the that the, the question has to be understood of course my speech has to be synthesized understood now nlp plus speech plus vision this is what is multi modal conversational ai can i combine all of those things like very similar to if i'm talking to an actual human sales person there the sales person will clearly understand my question will clearly understand which which object my 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 finger is pointing towards and give me an answer that hey this this is going to cost you $15 so that is what is multi modal conversational ai and it's a very complex thing it's 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 like very very complex thing that happens and nvidia jarvis is is such a is a fantastic framework that can help you to do conversational ai and uh, uh, one particular uh, uh, toolkit which is called as nemo uh, is specifically used for for uh, nlp and speech for for you to work upon uh, pre trained models uh, it has multiple um, components like asr automated speech recognition nlp and tts text to speech um, all these things are 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 part of nemo so jarvis and nemo these are super good very advanced toolkits that are available today if you are working in conversational ai uh, and then comes uh, healthcare another big area right so healthcare has got multiple uh, areas of, of 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 development in the recent past um, the first one is what we call as parabricks which basically is used for genome sequencing then 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 you have bio megatron uh, and then um, megatron based models imaging very very important if you have to take decisions if you have to do diagnostics based on medical images images could be ct scan or mri or or x rays or whatever 
that is where deep learning is used in a big way and uh, there are other uh, components like agx gaudi and discovery drug dis- uh, for the drug discovery etc the these are all computational platforms specifically for healthcare so depending upon whatever your area of interest is you, you can pick pick it up and there is a huge huge upsurge happening in the genome sequencing area also right mm. and this is a, once again we know that it's a very very complex thing and uh, uh, and uh, uh, gpus gpu based uh, simulation of genome genome sequencing is 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 accelerating the secondary uh, analysis is is bringing down the cycle times uh, of of genome sequencing uh, drastically so right so where do i get all these these this uh, fantastic software it is all available in a place called ngc ngc.nvidia.com ngc expands to nvidia gpu cloud it could be slightly misleading nvidia gpu cloud is not a, a, a hardware cloud platform it's not a hyperscaler like a aws or a azure or a, or a google cloud it is not the hardware cloud that we are offering ngc is a set of software collections it's a set of software repositories which which give you all these these the 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 the, the powerful software that i talked about right uh, be it javas or rapids or or uh, nemo or uh, transline toolkits deepstream sdks uh, and um, javas etc etc all these things are available in this this repository called ngc.nvidia.com so please go to this website and explore there is so much you can you, you can learn and make use of from this particular website right that's on the software side next 5 minutes i'm going to talk on the hardware and then we'll wind up the session and then possibly open it up for questions um, so all this software runs needs to run on a hardware right the latest hardware is called as the ampere gpu nvidia ampere gpu a technologically very very advanced architecture goes without saying it's like amazing whatever goes into the architecture right of course the world's largest 7 nanometer chip and then it has got uh, it supports multiple hardware based acceleration um, computing acceleration techniques like examples could be what we call as tensor cores which basically supports multiple data formats like you know fp16 floating point 16 floating point 32 uh, of course the du- dual precision for scientific computing applications and then there's a new format called the tf32 etc uh, and a combination of all these data formats will help you to accelerate your science, your uh, uh, ai computing be it for training or be it for inferencing and then support for sparsity hardware level of support for sparsity we all know that when we deal with the deep learning machine learning we deal with huge matrices and manipulating matrices is a very complex thing primarily because of the sparsity of the the sparse nature of the uh, of the matrices that we are talking about here so how do i manage this through a hardware feature which is called a sparsity that is also there as part of the ampere architecture right and then there is a there is a technique called mig multi instance gpu which basically Uh, partitions your your gpu into up to seven uh, mini gpus we call it a instances multiple instances and each of these instances can support independent software ecosystem like for example the first instance can do training the second can do inferencing the third one can do tensor flow the fourth one can do a jupyter notebook the fifth one can do uh, yeah uh, hyperfront computing application like amber or whatever so each of these instances of gpus mini gpus which are carved out of one gpu can run independent software ecosystems and do independent jobs and up to 8 such gpus can be contained in one machine which means 8 times 7 is 56 instances 56 different tasks can simultaneously happen in one machine and hundreds of that machines can be clustered together so all these are big advancements so far as the hardware of the uh, gpu is concerned and um, last but not the least very very high speed interconnects between the gpus be it um, Uh, intra node communication up to 8 gpus in one machine how do these 8 gpus communicate with one another uh, it's a 600 gbps huge speed and and when i cluster multiple such machines inter node communication how do those machines communicate with one another with the help of the melanox uh, erstwhile melanox now melanox is an nvidia company uh, nvidia uh, infiniband techniques all this is or at recent advancements in the, in the hardware part of it and so so these are the gpus but but there is a machine that carries the gpus right the, the dgx a100 is one system it's an ai supercomputing system and just to drive home the example the the, the drive home the context 
uh, it, it supports five petaflops of AI training uh, performance. Five petaflops. Um, many of you may not understand how the uh, may not understand how big five petaflops is. Let me try to explain it. If you need to build CPU only servers, you need hundreds of servers to be clustered together to achieve five petaflops. And all that is now you know, available in one system, whatever you're seeing on the screen. Uh, it can give you five petaflops of AI performance, right? And many such systems can be clustered together. And hence the number of petaflops of AI computing can keep on increasing, right? So what used to take, like say for example, hundreds of servers to build uh, one particular uh, AI computing cluster, like what you are seeing on the screen has now been shrunk to this. Right? So before, hundreds of servers needed for achieving a computing performance before and after or now is, is, it can be shrunk into something like this. So practically what this means is that the cost of computation has gone down drastically. That's important. The cost of computation has gone down drastically, right? You can never compare a CPU server with a GPU server. That's not a fair comparison. Because what CPU, what hundreds of CPU servers can do can be done by one GPU server. It's like you cannot compare the, the price of a motorcycle and a, and a train, right? Like hundreds of motorcycles are replaced by one train. And when you do that, the price of a train would, would possibly be, be lower than the price of hundreds of or thousands of motorcycles. That is what we are talking about here. And the cost of computation, thanks to all the great features that I talked about, both the hardware features, which I very briefly touched upon, and very importantly, the software features that I talked about and the, uh, and the very elegant software ecosystem that I talked about has resulted in bringing down the cost of computation drastically. And hence that is fueling the growth of, of AI machine learning and deep learning. So that is what I basically wanted to, to, to talk to you guys today about, um, um, I, I'm sorry, I ran over by four minutes, sorry about it. But uh, uh, that's what I wanted to talk to you today in terms of the recent advancement in, in AI computing technology. Nothing to apologize at all about. So there, that is uh, amazing, um, you know, what um, power you're bringing to AI as an NVIDIA. Um, now, one question, there are a couple of other questions, but, you know, one question I'm sure is in the mind of a lot of students here is, um, uh, you know, there's so many models there, and I just actually went on to the NGC as well and was looking at it. Uh, how does a, you know, somebody new to AI really get their head around all of these models and know what model to pick and how to use it? Um, is there uh, somewhere they can go to learn how to use these tools? Yes. So NGC by itself has got a lot of literature attached to it. You go to any particular bucket and choose uh, one particular, uh, you know, tool that you, your software tool that you're interested in. There is very, very, very good documentation that is available inside NGC itself. And of course, I mean, okay. people like you do fantastic service of training people on, on how to use these things. But then the, the short answer is NGC itself is very, very well documented. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions here. Uh, Braj, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Uh, yes, sir. So my question is, uh, which uh, which library we have to prefer uh, between for model training between DASC and QML? Because DASC is also using the parallel computing and which is much faster than the scikit-learn. And so, uh, yeah. so QML is the replacement uh, for scikit-learn. So your scikit-learn code can be replaced by QML. Dask is the underlying framework that that helps you to run in a in a parallel mode, right? I mean, you cannot. I mean, it's a wrong comparison between Dask and QML. Uh, uh, so Dask is an underlying architecture that makes you run it in a parallel mode, right? QML and scikit-learn are the right comparison. And Skykit-Learn, which runs on CPUs, runs in a much more accelerated, accelerated fashion on QML with very, very minimal changes to your existing Skykit-Learn code. Great, thank you, Sundar. Um, 
Uh, Santosh, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sir, sir. Uh, so basically, my question was around: uh, Are the libraries available uh, for training purposes? Because most of them would not be open source, right? So, I mean, if we want to leverage the QML and uh, the CUDA libraries, so would they be yes. available for training? San Santosh, yes. Just go to ngc.nvidia.com. I'm flashing it on the uh, screen now, and you can download them. There. Yeah. Free. I mean, don't you? I mean, more meaning strategy. They are free for you to download. Okay, ncc.nvidia.com. You can go and download free. Brilliant. Thank you, Sundar. Uh, and Karan Jyot, would you like to ask your question? Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, so, great presentation. So, I wanted to ask that, uh, like, from the current MPR architecture that NVIDIA has launched recently, uh, they have stopped the support for the SLI the parallelization that you can insert multiple GPUs. So I wanted to ask that, how will this affect the G multiple GPU parallelization for deep learning for the upcoming uh, stack, software stack? Right. So uh, so SLI is, is a very uh, specific technique mainly used for visualization purpose, mainly used uh, for visualization and uh, um, I'm not sure, Karan, to be honest with you, whether Ampere supports SLI or whether Ampere will have support for SLI. I know it was supported until um, last generation. Uh, but uh, as you can see on the screen, on the top, top bottom right of the screen, there are very advanced techniques. The technique is called NVLink, NV -Link, which, 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 which helps GPU to GPU uh, communication in, in, uh, happen in, in enormous speed. I mean, just to give you the number, it happens at 600 Gbps uh, to drive home the point. PC Express runs at 18 to 20 Gbps, giga uh, bytes per second. Whereas we are here, we are talking about 600 G Gbps. So GP to GP communication is certainly happening in a very fast way. And intra node inside one system, it happens through NVLink and NV switch. And then multiple between multiple such nodes happens through uh, the Infini band interconnect. Uh, that much I can tell you. On SLI, I don't know the answer. I need to check back whether Ampere supports SLI or whether we, we do have a plan to support SLI. I, I'm not sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sundar. And um, uh, Rahul, do you want to ask your question? Sir, ask, sir I want to ask sir, uh, that uh, quantum computers performing quantum computing and uh, comparing it th with them with the distributive systems utilizing GPU computing, which will be more efficient and faster performance wise? So GPUs are going to support quantum computing in the near future, in the next week or so, we are going to, we, are, we will be hosting a huge conference, a technology conference. In fact, uh, Dr. Srabjut Singh uh, will, will forward you, all of you an invitation uh, sometime today. I'll request his help to do that. And once you get the invitation, please go ahead and register for that conference. And there will be very exciting announcements, which will also include some announcements on quantum computing that will happen uh, during the conference. It is scheduled for next week, April 12th to 16th. Don't miss the keynote, our NVIDIA CEO's keynote. It's, it, it's a, yeah, there will be a lot of interesting announcements, including announcements on quantum computing uh, on that day. I, uh, Dr. Srabjut Singh will, will, will forward the invitation to you sometime later. Yeah. I will definitely, yeah. definitely Sundar. And, uh, you know, thank you uh, for, uh, you know, making this conference available to everybody by, by having it uh, online and free. So uh, hopefully everybody's going to take advantage of something that's otherwise so yes. difficult to get access to. Uh, so the thank, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sure, sure. Sorry, sorry, just one more minute. Uh, uh -huh. So, the, I mean, Dr. Sarjot mentioned a very important thing, guys. It, this time, because it's virtual, it is free. Typically, it is priced quite high, and, uh, and it happens in the US, a physical conference. That is how it has always been happening. This time, it is free. So please do make use of it. It's a virtual conference. Once you have registered, you can get access to the uh, to the content at any point in time. And please do register through the link that Dr. Singh will send, will send you uh, later. All right. Thank you. Thank sure. you. And I, I think you know another important thing is that the who's, who's who of AI 
are actually speaking there, right? So just about every big name that you can think of is actually speaking there. So it should be a, a very, very exciting conference. Uh, Sundar, thank you so much for coming out and spending the time with us. This is an incredible uh, you know, experience for everyone here. And uh, I do look forward to exploring uh, more of the libraries that you have uh, shared with us that NVIDIA is making available. And I think the, the transfer learning toolkit is, is uh, obviously going to be a, a huge boost right, for uh, the applications that the students here uh, will be working on. So thank you again and uh, look forward to uh, having you again on one of our uh, master classes and, and sessions, webinars uh, in the future for you to enlighten us uh, further. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you for inviting me over and it's been my pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, have a good day. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye.